بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير As we were discussing yesterday we were discussing some of the famous personalities from the time of the Sahaba and then the famous personalities after him. There are so many personalities that, we've dis- uh, that we can discuss in terms of the muhaddithin, mufassireen, and the awliya Allah who've come to this place. I'm not going to go into a big list of these because that could become boring. It's generally only valuable if we have reference to these people and if you understand who these people are. If I just give you a list of names, it's not going to be uh, very useful maybe. But I will mention a few because these are some of the earliest people that we should know about. These are the people who are considered to be the people that everybody references when you discuss piety, when you discuss spirituality, when you discuss the soul, for example, when you discuss asceticism, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wilayat. These are the most famous people. So I mentioned the Sahaba and the Tabi'een already, and we mentioned Dhunnun al-Misri. The, the, he, was the, uh, he was the great uh, mutasawwif and uh, ascetic from from Egypt, Al-Misri. The next person I want to mention, and these are people you pick up any book on uh, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these people will be mentioned in there. So the next person I want to mention is the great uh, Sayyidina Sari As-Saqati. Sari As-Saqati. Many people they just call him Sirri, As- Sirri Siqti. Rahmatullahi it's Sari As-Saqati. He died eventually in 257. 257 Hijri. So you can tell how early he is. When you say 257, just to put you into the picture, this is uh, around the time when Imam Bukhari passes away. Just before this, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal passes away. This is around Imam Muslim's time. He's alive around this time and he passes around Imam Tirmidhi. And th- this, is, this is this time, Imam Tabari. A lot of the development is taking place at this time. A lot of the development of the Islamic sciences is taking place at this time. And people like Sariya Sakhati are deciding to you know, leave everything and just focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is considered one of the leaders of the ascetics of Baghdad. And at that time, this is the, one of the glorious periods of Baghdad as well. Abbasid Khalif. As I told you before, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur established Baghdad. And then throughout the whole world, people came from throughout the whole world. You had some of the best of the Muslims, uh, both in terms of spirituality, in terms of academics, have come to Baghdad and they're making this the glorious city. Baghdad has had a very, very long history in terms of that. Much of the great literature has been written in Baghdad. So, for example, there was a great scholar uh, called uh, Khatib al-Baghdadi. Khatib al-Baghdadi. He wrote this book about the history of Baghdad in about 50 volumes. And these are all big, big volumes in about 50 volumes. And it is such a book. It is such a book that in there he mentions everybody that has ever set foot in Baghdad whether he lived in Baghdad or was born in Baghdad or passed through it on going the way to Hajj or whatever. He mentions who they are, where they came from, what their story is, what hadith they related. It's this massive dictionary of everything. It's just amazing. Uh, even the Orientalists today, I remember when I had, uh, uh, during my PhD, I had the upgrade exam. So I remember one of the Orientalist professors there at SOAS, Hugh Kennedy, is. he says, have you consulted the... Uh, Khati Baghdadi's uh, Tariq of Baghdad. I said, yeah, because he, uh, uh, I was speaking about Abu Layth as Samarqandi rahmatullahi. So, if he ever came to Baghdad, Khatib al Baghdadi would have had him. If Khatib Baghdadi doesn't mention him, then that means he hasn't come to Baghdad. That's how good this book is. So, this is Baghdad of that time. Unfortunately, it's a very sad scene right now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring it back. Because um, in Baghdad, you've got where Imam Abu Hanifa passed away. There's a big complex and that entire area is called A'zamiyyah from Imam A'zam. Imam A'zam is called A'zamiyyah. Then another, uh, I think it's to the south of that, there's another area called Karkh, which is from, the, uh, this is from where new Ma'roof al-Karkhi was from there. Big, big, very big saint. Another person from there was this great Hanafi, uh, Hanafi alim who was from there. Uh, Allama Karkhi, who was the Ustad of Allama Jassas, Jassas al-Razi. Some major scholars who came there. This was the powerhouse. This is where a lot of the Hanafi madhab developed afterwards. In Baghdad and in another place. You know the other places? In Afghanistan, in Balkh. 
These were the Balkh and then Bukhara and Samarkand. These are the places where the early Hanafi madhab developed. Anyway, coming back to Jerusalem, this Sariya Saqati Rahmatullah Ali was one of the, um, he, he uh, was considered to be one of the, the great awliya of the time. These are some of his sayings. He said, the shortest way to Jannah is not to ask anybody for anything. Do not seek assistance from anybody. That's the shortest way to Jannah, is not to seek assistance from anybody, not to take anything from anybody, and not to have anything to give to anybody. <coughs> right? you, you understand? It's not being stingy. I just don't have to give anybody anything. I, I don't... No intention for having uh, any possessions of this world. He also said that he who wishes to safeguard his faith and to relieve his heart from worries must live in seclusion from people. I want to explain that when people hear about these stories about seclusion, they think it means becoming a hermit. In Islam, hermitude is not permitted. The kamal and the perfection and accomplishment is in living with people but still being able to worship Allah and not, not letting people distract you and not letting them cause you to sin. A lot of people make excuses that the reason why they sin is because of other people. They use other people as an excuse. They blame others. It's our own discipline that matters. Yes, somebody may act strange in front of us. That doesn't mean that we have to then say something bad about them. We're not supposed to be taking aib out of people. We are sometimes so sensitive that we judge people within five minutes. We meet somebody for five minutes and we have a judgment about them. Then after that, we meet them after a few days for another five minutes and suddenly we change our judgment. We should never have had the first judgment. It's ajeeb. So you have to realize this. What I realized uh, recently, I was in Bahrain and one of my friends uh, who uh, uh, works uh, as a consultant, business consultant, he's saying that these Yemenis who are big businessmen in, in Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, he says that if they want to find out how you are, you know what they do? They will take you for Umrah. Say, come on, let's go for Umrah. They'll take you for Umrah and in Umrah, they'll figure out everything about you because you're on a journey, you're going to Arabia. And in fact, another thing he said that if, you want, if you're looking for a, uh, for a prospective son-in-law, take him for Umrah, a free trip for Umrah. I mean, of course, you can't all do that. They're in Saudi anyway, so they can do that. Come on, let's go for Umrah, I'll pay your ticket, come over, right? But it's in a journey and especially in one of these strenuous journeys that people uh, are revealed. The word suffer in Arabic, suffer. In English, suffer means to suffer, which also is part of traveling. But in Arabic, the word suffer, safara yusafiru, a woman who doesn't cover is called a musafira, a woman who's uncovered. So suffer means to uncover. And when you're, it uncovers a number of things. It uncovers the reality of places for you, of people for you, and it also uncovers the realities of a person's personality. So that, that's, that's what you learn from here. So we've come on this journey. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all for any excesses against anybody else. But let us not judge anybody just by looking at them a few minutes or speaking to them for, or eating with them or whatever the case is. We should refuse judgment. We leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes a habit. Anyway, this is what he said. He also said that one night, because he was here in Jerusalem, he said, one night I performed my nafil prayer and then I stretch my leg into the mihrab. So he must have been sitting there or something and he stretched his leg into the mihrab and he said, I heard a voice saying, Oh Sari, this is the way kings sit. So then I quickly pushed, uh, pulled my legs back in and saying that I swear by your might that I will never again stretch my leg like this. This is the adab of a masjid. After his visit to Jerusalem, he returned to Baghdad and he passed away there. The next one I want to mention quickly is Abu Qasim Junaid ibn Muhammad al-Baghdadi, another one. Junaid al-Baghdadi, he's famously known as Junaid al-Baghdadi. I'm sure many of you must have heard about him. He's originally from Nahawand. Again, that's in Khorasan. You know, Iran and that area, that's where he's originally from. But he was brought up in Iraq. And he, he accompanied Sariya Saqti rahmatullahi. I think that was his uncle or something. He was connected to him. And Harith al-Muhasibi, these are the other famous names. Junaid al-Baghdadi was fascinated by Jerusalem. I'm sure we all are. Junaid al-Baghdadi was fascinated by Jerusalem and its implications, especially the Mi'raj aspect. You know, you go to Syria and there's lots of Baraka there, Sham in general. But why Jerusalem? It has the Masjid and this is a stop for Rasulullah and then the ascension from here. So it creates this 
this idea, this, uh, uh, so he, 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 he writes about a number of these things in a book of his called um, Dawa'ul Arwah, which means the cure for the souls. Now I'm going to move forward to another very famous individual, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. As I said, there's numerous other people during the Mamluk and the Seljukid periods, but I just want to mention Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is originally from today's Iran, Tus, which is close to Mashhad, kind of northeast of Iran. He was a Persian-speaking individual. Such an intellectual, such an intellectual and aqil insan, he eventually, out of, he, uh, just to give you an idea, he was born in 450 Hijri and he died in 505 Hijri. How many years does that make him? 55, right? Which is not a huge amount of life. But he is probably the most celebrated of the Muslim scholars, both by Muslims and non-Muslims. I don't think there's any university in the world, you know, a non-Muslim university as well, who doesn't discuss him. Even when I was doing my master's, I was given a, an essay to write. In which subject was Imam Ghazali's influence greater? In, out of all the subjects he wrote on, in Tasawwuf, Sufism, spirituality, or in philosophy, uh, creed and theology. And my conclusion was that it's very difficult to determine because in both of them, he was an absolute master. But then I said that in terms of general benefit and long-term benefit, it has to be in terms of spirituality. He's the one who made spirituality plausible and acceptable and something nice, the way he explained it. He was just an absolute psychologist in terms of the way he used to discuss things now he becomes at a very young age at 30 something he becomes one of the greatest scholars of the muslim world how do you suggest how do you know somebody's the greatest scholar he becomes like that because he is given the highest position of teaching in the muslim world which was in baghdad it was the nizamiya college there was a one of the seljuks uh, his uh, name was uh, Nidhamuddin uh, Atusi. He established a number of colleges called the Nidhamiya College. One was in Baghdad, one was in Shiraz, uh, one was in Nishapur. These were all the famous story, uh, cities of the Muslim world. For Baghdad, which was the center, it's like Oxford, Cambridge kind of idea, right? Harvard, Azhar, whatever you want to say. That was the biggest place. And Imam Ghazali was made the big scholar there. So he taught there for a number of years, and that would be, if anybody scholar, scholar, if any scholar wanted a high position, but that would be it. Now, the most interesting thing is that he, after a few years, he begins to get worried. He says, all of this is show. All I'm doing is show. This is all ostentation. And he decided, I need to leave this position. Nobody in their right mind, you know, so-called would leave that position. You know, imagine leaving the top position. So he, he, because he was, he was a thinker. In fact, he said that I started afresh, although I was born a Muslim, but I started thinking afresh with no faith. I kind of stripped myself of all faith and I discussed and studied all the main ideologies of the day. And I went into each one as somebody looking for the reality, not somebody in a biased way that I know it's wrong, I'm just going to attack it. But he, in there trying to find out. And eventually he came to the realization that it's spirituality and the spiritual way, which is the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most effective way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyway, to cut a long story short, he decided he needs to leave this position because it's all fame and show and he needs to work on himself. And he found it very difficult to leave. He kept putting it off. And then he said, Allah help me. It, there came a time when I couldn't speak anymore. Now I'm giving dars to all the major scholars of the town and suddenly I can't speak anymore. I've got a problem with speaking. You know, my tongue doesn't work. So then finally, Alhamdulillah, that helped me and I left the job and everybody's thinking, what is wrong with him? So then this deep spiritual crisis, it, he decided to leave for Hijaz. So he left Baghdad first for Syria. So in the Umawi Masjid, Jami al-Umawi, there's a special room that he stayed there for a while. In those days, you could kind of do that. You didn't need your visas and things like that. As long as you didn't do any politics or whatever, and you were fine with the rulers of the time and whatever the case was, they wouldn't bother you. 
right? It was different. So he then from Syria, from Sham, he went to, uh, to Mecca. On his return, he again stopped in Syria and then he came to Jerusalem and for, he stayed here for around 10 years. Entire period was around 11 years that he stayed out. He stayed here for 10 years, spending his time in just lots of adhkar and worship and dhikr and so on and so forth. According to Ibn al-Athir, who is another great historian of ours, uh, Ibn al-Athir is a great historian, died in 630 Hijri. He says, while in Jerusalem, Imam Ghazali stayed at the small masjid of Babur Rahmah. Now that's the one we saw today from the outside. Um, we saw the outside wall of it. So obviously in the inside, there's a structure there. That is the door that the Christians believe that the Isa Islam will come in from. Um, the cemetery is outside it. So he stayed there and that's where he wrote. And it's called the Zawiya al Ghazaliya after him. And then finally, he started seeing all these dreams and everything. He decided to leave. And then, remember, this is now around 498. Just coming to the end of the century. 500th century. And people were saying that Allah is going to send somebody to revive the faith. So, then he, he wrote his Ihya ul during this time. And then, eventually, he said, look, I need to come out of this and help people. He, he had so much yaqeen that he could help people that he decided to eventually say, I need to help people. Otherwise, he felt that it was the deception of shaitan that he stay in seclusion. This is aram, you know, this is easy. So then people need the help and then he started writing. And he basically criticizes everybody from the leaders to the normal people, to the scholars, the fuqaha, the jurists, the Sufis, everybody. And he does it in such a way that it's just absolutely beautiful. So that's uh, Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali who also um, was honored by this place and who also graced this place in a sense. Now, um, there's numerous others which is, as I said, I'm not going to talk about anybody more. There's Muhammad ibn Hatim al-Tusi, Abu Bakr al-Khujani. But one thing I will mention is that the Maghribis, the North Africans, specifically like Moroccans and so on, they had a very special connection with this place. I haven't been able to look at why yet, but they came here in large numbers. And that is why this area outside here, this Maghrib area, the, the Western area, became known as the Ma Maghariba quarter. Right, which is the Moroccan quarter. Unfortunately, that was the one that was taken in the war and just leveled to make that big uh, area outside so that the Jews can come and do uh, their worship there. But that was that entire area that was called the Maghariba quarter. So, because you have the Muslim quarter, the Maghariba quarter specifically from them. So you can tell that that's very important. Then you have the Armenian and others because the Armenians were supposed to be some of the first of the Christians or some of the first people to believe in Isa alayhi salam. So that's why you've got a lot of, these were not just Maghribis by the way, these were Andalusians as well. Because remember Andalusia, people had to escape Andalusia and they, most of them came to, uh, to Morocco. Now when you go to Morocco, there's a famous city called Fez. That city, the reason it's called Fez, uh, Fez comes from Fas. In Arabic, anybody who knows what Fasun means? It means an axe. Fasun means an axe. You know, that's what Ibrahim Islam used to bring the idols down. So because when they were digging the foundations of the city of Fez, they discovered an axe in there, so they called it Fez. That's what the story goes. Fez has two parts to it. One is the part which has the Qarawiyin, Jami al Qarawiyin, the first university in the world. What is the first university in the world? Not Azhar University. Not Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or any of these others. It's Jami'a al Qarawiyin. The reason it's called Qarawiyin, I believe, is because the Muslims escaped from Qairuan, which is in Tunisia today. Very famous city before. There were some issues there. They came here. The Andalusians came there. Now, there was this Fatima binti Muhammad. Fatima binti Muhammad. Ummul Banin, her name is. She is the one who established this university. When I say university, they were obviously madrasas. But when I say university, I mean a place in which you have students who can live there and they prepare, they're, they're paid for and so on and so forth. Be before it was just like, you know, you came to the mosque, there would be a class going on, you, you made your own arrangements. But this was like a dormitory place, first university, proper, you know, nisab, uh, syllabus and so on. It was established by a Muslim woman, N not by a man. I mean, a Muslim woman, Allah gave her the tawfiq to establish the first university. Her sister, not to be outdone, then established Jami'a al-Andalus because 
if you've been to Fez, and we, inshallah when you go to Fez, you'll see there are two parts to Fez. The new part and the old part. The old part is the Moroccans and so on. The other part are those people who came back from Andalus after they were, they were persecuted there and they had to run away. They established themselves in the other side of Andalus. So that's where Jamil Andalus is still there, but that's not functioning as a madrasa right now. Qarawiyin is. I visited Qarawiyin. That is still functioning as a madrasa, but not, um, uh, not the Al-Andalus. It's a big masjid. Yes, I was saying about the Andalusians, because they all had to escape Andalusia, they also came here. So when you say Maghariba, it means Maghribis and the Andalusians, because all their descendants are there now as well. Now what I'm going to do is just take us through a quick history, not very detailed, just the timeline history of Jerusalem. Just so you understand what's happened here in the past. This is BC. We're talking about before Isa Ali, so I'm going to start from there. I don't know how useful it is to you, but just to give you an idea of why there are so many contending forces in this area. In terms of the first person to build here, there's no agreement as to the first person who built this place, who it was built by. All we know for sure, as the hadith mentions, is that it was built 40 years after Makkah Mukarram, after Masjid al-Haram in Makkah Mukarram. This was the second masjid. That's we know for sure. Who built it, as I mentioned earlier, could have been angels, or it could have been Adam alayhi salam. It could have been one of his descendants. Because we know that about Makkah, that that's, uh, the, the Kaaba was built either by angels or by Adam alayhi salam. And then this place could have been built by Adam alayhi salam or by one of his children um, or, or descendants. However, then we carry on to 1010 BC. That's 1000 years before Isa alayhi salam. That's when Dawud alayhi salam attacks and captures Jerusalem. Dawud alayhi salam attacks and captures Jerusalem. Jerusalem was somebody else's. He captures it. Jerusalem then becomes city of David or whatever you want to call it. And he unites everybody. So it becomes because the Bani Israel had split into two. So he unites everybody here. It, but he wasn't able to make their temple. He wasn't able to make their place of worship here. It was in 962 when Sulaiman alayhi salam, his son, builds the first, uh, first temple. Now this is according to the normal history of this place. As I said, there are other opinions that Sulaiman alayhi salam was not even here, which is a, pretty much sounds like an extreme opinion, right? So I'm going with the normal history of this place. This is 962. Then it carries on 587 BC now, right? So from 962 to 587, how many years are we talking about? 587, 6, 7, 8, 9, about 400, just less than 370, 380 years after that. This comes the Babylonian siege, right? Babylonian, you know what I'm talking about? Babylon is Iraq. That's the area we're talking about. So the ba who? Nebuchadnezzar. This is a very famous leader from Babylon who came and who basically destroyed the first temple. He destroyed the first temple and he basically ex exiled everybody. All the, all, the, uh, all the Bani Israel who were here, he exiled all of them to Babylon. I believe this is the time when three of the tribes had read in their books that the next prophet, the final prophet who's going to come, is going to come to an oasis. That means a green part in the middle of a desert that's going to have some water and palm trees. And they found that Medina Munawwara had that description. So this is the Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynuqa, and what's the third? Banu Quraidha, right? So the three tribes, they came and settled in Medina Munawwara. That's where they were from. Anyway, he destroyed the temple and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this in the Quran. We will send people against you if you do sin and so on. We will send people against you and they will destroy it like they did it the first time. Then they did it again. Even if you don't understand Arabic, the words just show you something about destruction here. That's the power of the Arabic language. Anyway, 
Now what happens afterwards, after this, uh, the whole point of this was that if you don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you don't do it properly, you're going to be destroyed. That's basically what Allah says in, in Surah Al-Isra. If you read that, just the first part of Surah Al-Isra, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions there. So he says that's why they were destroyed first, then they were forgiven, they came back, a new city was built, and then again they were destroyed again because they messed up again. That's why there's a number of uh, Jewish groups today like some in Stamford Hill who do not believe that they're allowed to come back here because they are in exile. Because it's not that they're in exile because of their sins and doings and whatever it is. And that's why they have to wait. Now we, we move to 539. So from 587, we move to 539. 587 is when uh, it was destroyed and they were all exiled. 539, Jerusalem becomes part of the Eba Nari satrapy, whatever that is, of the Ark. Achaemenid, Achaemenid Empire after King Cyrus the Great conquers the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Cyrus, this is like the Persian Empire, right? Cyrus the Great, they kept, they, they, they overcome the Neo-Babylonian Empire and they, they become the rulers here. But remember, there's no Bani Israel here at the time. Then the Persian rule begins. So the Persian rule begins 537 BC. Cyrus the Great issues the Edict of Cyrus, allowing some of the, the Persians have also always been fine with the Bani Israel. The Romans haven't. Do you understand? So when the Persians come back in 537, they allow the Jews to return from the Babylonian captivity and to rebuild the temple. So in 516, the second temple is built. Uh, this was the sixth year of Dar Darius the Great. Now comes the Greeks. 332 BC, Jerusalem falls to none other than Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great, as you know, six-year Macedonian conquest of he conquest of the empire of Darius the Persian. So Alexander the Great is a Greek. He overcomes the Persians. So all of this comes under the Greeks now. Then from 164 to 163 BC, you have the Hasmonean period. I don't know too much about that, so I'm going to move on to 63 BC. 63 BC, the Roman Republic, under a person called Pompey the Great, besieges and takes the city. So now you get the Romans back in here, or the first time, right? Yeah, you get the Romans here. Pompey enters the temple, but he leaves the treasure. He doesn't mess with the treasure. He does go into the temple, but he doesn't do anything to the treasure. 40 to 37 BC, the Roman Senate appoints Herod, the king of the Jews. He makes them... So basically the whole area was under the Romans, but because now there were a lot of Bani Israel, the Yahud were here, that's why they make Herod the king of the Jews. So this became like a semi-independent. They have to look after it for the Romans. So that was Herod. That's why you keep hearing the name of Herod. They also provide him with an army that he must look after everything. So 37 to 35 BC, Herod the Great builds the Antonio Fortress. In 19 BC, he expands this place and he rebuilds the temple apparently. That's where you see the Herod, you know, the Herod's Gate and Herod's uh, the stones and all this, that and the other. 6 BC, that's the end of the Herodian governate in Jerusalem. Now we go after Isa. Isa is now around. 28 to 30 after Isa alayhi salam's birth it are the three years of the ministry of Isa alayhi salam. Now, this is very interesting. If you look at the whole Quran and you look at the whole Bible, you'll only, you can only figure out about 40 days of Isa alayhi salam's life. You can only work out about 40 days or 50 days of Isa alayhi salam's life. Sayyid Sulaiman Nadwi has written this. Because you hear about his birth, the miraculous birth and you know his uh, Hanna and Mary, Maryam alayhi salam and then Isa alayhi salam's birth and then after that silence. You don't know what happens, everybody's silent about it. What happens for 30 years we don't know. When he's about 30 or so, suddenly he appears in the sense that in history he appears and now you, for about three years you know what's happening and then after that you know the whole issue happens where he's taken to the heavens and the crucifixion takes place. So we only know about three years of his ministry. That is 28 to 30 AD apparently. Then you have the first Jewish Roman war with the Judean rebellion led by, uh, by, by, by one of them in about 66 to 73. 
in 70, in, in 70, this is a very important time. Remember, we've got a second temple, right? We've got the second temple where first one was destroyed. They built the second ones when the Persians allowed them to come back in there. Romans had come in. Now, at this time, you've got at 70 C, uh, CE, a, G, uh, a siege of Jerusalem happens because there's a Jewish-Roman war that takes place. The, the Jews who are here, they're fighting with the Romans who are supposed to be the people, you know, over them. So, 70 CE, siege of Jerusalem. The, the, the Roman emperor of the time is Vespasian. His son is called Titus. Now, you must have heard the guy telling us Titus, you know, we call him Titus. Vespasian, his son is Titus. Vespasian must have sent Titus here and I've read a lot of the history of this time. I don't think he meant to do it, but he gave an instruction and whoever he gave an instruction to, they totally eliminated the city. They broke the temple and they just eliminated it completely. You know? And I don't think it says that he, he may have not meant to do it, but it was just the hukum and the, uh, the command was given and it was just totally destroyed. He totally destroyed Herod's temple. Then, not only that, they took all the treasure from here. And they took all the people from here and they marched them to Rome. And if you go to Rome today, there is this Titus's arch. It's this victory arch. In, you get quite a few of victory arches. So there's a few in Rome. This one is Titus's victory arch. You look at the inscriptions in there, it has the menorah and all of these descriptions. Now what's very interesting is that those are all the treasures of the temple. There were some treasures of the temple. They say the covenant of the ark and this, that and the other. They had all these treasures, very important to them. All of that was taken. So there's some archaeologists tried to discover where that treasure eventually got to. Nobody really knows where the ark of the covenant, some say it's in, it's in Ethiopia, some say it's in the Vatican. There's a big difference of opinion as to where this ark of the covenant is, this tabut. You know, which was supposed to give them strength and victory. It has a few things in there like the staff of Moses and Musa alayhi salam and a few other things. That's the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I visited this arch and it says down there that you know, they don't allow you to go through it. It's been blocked by special instruction from the Israeli government. Because of course, even it was done for the victory uh, against the Jews. So they obviously don't like it. So uh, nobody's allowed to go through that. It's this massive structure in, in, in Rome. Anyway, let's move on now. From 70, we go to 130. Emperor Hadrian now visits the ruins of Jerusalem and decides to rebuild it as a city dedicated to Jupiter. So these are the Romans who are not Christian yet. They still believe in Jupiter. He calls this place Elia Capitolinia. Elia Capitolinia. This is very important because you know in the hadith when they talk about Jerusalem, the Prophet refers to it in many hadith as Elia. So I used to always wonder why Elia. The reason is that at that time there was no Jerusalem here. He started a new city and he called it Elia. That's why it's called Elia Capitolina. He forbids Jewish and Christian presence. They were against all religions. They were, you know, so he forbids Jewish and Christian presence in the city. Then we get to 136 to 140, he, they build a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount, on this place, and a temple to Venus on the Calvary Mount. Calvary Mount is the one where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is based, you know, that we visited the other day. That's called the Mount Calvary and they built another temple there. Then 251. So that's over a hundred years afterwards. Bishop Alexander of Jerusalem is killed during a Roman Emperor Decius's persecution of Christians. The Roman Emperor Decius, you know who this is? This is the one who the Ashab al-Kahf dealt with. And Ashab al-Kahf, they were de dealing with this Christian who they were Christian, meaning they were followers of Isa alayhi salam. They wanted to stay on that faith, but everybody had changed. So the king of the time, the Roman Emperor of the time was called Decius. So that seems to be around this time. Now we move to the Byzantine period. The Byzantine is basically the Roman Empire turned Christian. Because you know Constantine, the famous Roman Empire uh, Emperor, he had some vision or whatever and he became Christian. And the whole Roman Empire now becomes Christian. Do you understand? That's, that's what it is. And much of the Western world only owes, in fact, Christianity owns its 
popularity today and its endurance until today to Constantine. Because if that Roman, because they were being persecuted, left, right and center. And if Constantine had not had this vision to become a Christian, there wouldn't be much left. You know, like now we have two billion Christians around the world. It's owed to the, apparently to Constantine. Because right? you know, the Roman Empire, the major empire of the day. So, Emperor, of Const uh, Emperor Constantine, he, it's now called the Byzantines. Because they were based in Byzantium, which is Istanbul. The old name of Istanbul is called Byzantium. So they call the Byzantines. He confirms the status of Elia as a patriarchate. A significant wave of immigration of Christians now come to the city, right? And this is when they say the city was re renamed Jerusalem from Elia. This was around 324, 325. And this is when the, around the time when the Council of Nicaea takes place. <laughs> Council of Nicaea is when they decide that all the books that have come down from Isa al Islam, which one we're going to make the Bible and which one we're going to take out, which ones are we going to select to become the Bible and which ones we're going to take out. That's the Council of Nicaea around that time, right? So you can see how, how effective uh, this Constantine was. 325 uh, CE, we're talking about Christian era, right? The ban on Jews entering the city remains in force, but now they are allowed to enter once a year to pray at the Western Wall. And they're allowed to pray on this western wall once a year, a day of mourning for the destruction of the temple. So they're allowed to come in here and they're allowed to do that. 326 now. Constantine's mother, Helena, visits Jerusalem and she orders the destruction of Hadrian's temple to Venus on that Mount Calvary. 335. First church of the Holy Sepulchre built on the Cal Calvary. 600, now, 300 years after that, 610. Jerusalem becomes, now this is important for us, Jerusalem becomes the focal point of the Muslim Salat. You, you know, this is when Islam comes in and now you're praying towards Jerusalem. 610, Jewish revolt against Heraclius. Heraclius now is the emperor, Heracl. It's not Hercules. You know, in the Hadith, you have Abu Sufyan who went to meet Heracl. Heracl received the letter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, about becoming uh, coming to Islam and so on. So he asked some of his people, can you see if anybody from Arabia is in town? Because you know, they used to come here for trade. And you know who it was? Abu Sufyan, the enemy. So he, he is brought in with all of his, uh, his men and this Heraclius, intelligent man, he puts Abu Sufyan in the front and all of his guys at the back. And he says to them, if he tells an untruth, you tell me. So he can't communicate with them because he has to tell the truth. Now he's an enemy and they're at war, but there was just a ceasefire at that time. So Hierakl starts asking him questions. Is this a man whose forefathers were kings? He said, no. Is there somebody who's made this kind of uh, claim before? No. You know, does he, has he always told the truth? Yes. And so on and so on. He says, I could not, I, I, I could not enter any untruth in there because I was scared somebody's going to, and they wouldn't, they didn't want to be, the most interesting thing is that they did never want it to be called a liar. So he told all the truth. And then he said, have you guys had a peace treaty? And he said, this is where I was able to add a bit of suspicion by saying that, yes, we've got a peace treaty right now, but we're going to see if he, if he uh, honors it or not. Right? That was the only thing. Anyway, here, uh, at that time, Heraclius said that this is the way of prophets and this is how they are. And if, he, if I could go to him, I would wash his feet and so on and so forth. But then he never became Muslim. They say that he tried, but then people revolted in his... Uh, so he didn't want to lose his kingdom or whatever the case is. So he carried on. And then they actually fought wars against the Muslims. Tabuk. All of that was against the Muslims. Anyway, let's move on. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rum, Alif la meem, ghulibati rum, fi adna al-ardi, wa hum min ba'di ghalabihim sayaghlibun. So right now Romans have this place. This is, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Heraclius. He is, the, he is the emperor at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 614, there's a siege of Jerusalem. Jerusalem falls to Khusru, Khusru the second, Sasanid Empire. This is the Persian Sasanid Empire. Led, led by General Shahar, ba, Shahar Baraz. Now, during this time, there's lots of things that happen here, but basically, the, because uh, the, the Jewish had revolted against Heraclius, the Holy Sepulchre Church is burnt at that time. And 
a lot of their goods and everything is taken to Madain, which is Tesifan, right, which is in, uh, in Iran, uh, Iraq and Iran in that area. Anyway, in 620, Isra and Mi'raj happens. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi comes here during this time. But obviously it happened in the middle of the night and I don't think, you know, not many people found out about it. There's some stories about these things. 624, Jerusalem loses its place as the Qibla. Mecca becomes the Qibla now, 18 months after Hijrah. As the Prophet, as Allah had said in the Quran, that the Romans have just been overcome, but in a very short time, they will re-win, right? So now the Persians have this place for those few years. Now the, Byzan the Byzantines or Byzantines return 629. So they're back. Heraclius retakes Jerusalem after the decisive defeat of the Sassanid Empire at the Battle of Nineveh, Nineveh right? Then I'm going to push forward now from 629 to 638, nine years afterwards. What happens in 638? Umar enters Jerusalem. So 638, Umar anhu enters Jerusalem and mashallah that begins the Muslim, you know, uh, he, uh, there's a whole treaty that's written, which was that he will protect his churches, the people can stay there, whoever wants to leave, they can leave to the Romans. And the other thing that he mentions, according to the request of the Christians of the area, that don't still allow Jews to come in here. So Jews aren't allowed because of the request of the Christians. Otherwise, you know, Omar wouldn't have much of a problem with that, I would think. But it's because of their reason. So then we move forward, 1099 to 1187. Now this part needs a whole entire lecture separately, which we don't have the time for. So I'm just going to tell you the few highlights, right, in two minutes. So from 638, when Umar enters Jerusalem and takes it for the Muslims, we jump to 1099 to 1187. That's when we lose Jerusalem again. The Crusaders take it. How many years is that? 1099 to 1187. That's nearly around 90 years. You think it's bad today? I keep telling people, for 90 years, this place was a palace. There was no adhan taking place here, no buzz of the Quran being read. These walls were crying out for the Quran to be recited, for the dhikr of Allah to be made. Nothing. A cross on the Templum Demini. Uh, the cross, uh, uh, a gold cross was on the Qubbat al-Sakhra. They didn't break the building, they kept the building. And next door, that Marwanid, uh, the, the place we saw this morning, made stables. That's what happened here for over 90 years. You couldn't come into this city. Nobody, no Muslim. And when they came in and attacked, knee high, uh, they say waist high, in, not waist high, sorry, either ankle high or knee high in blood. That's how much killing the Crusaders did. I could never understand that before. But now when you see the narrow streets, you can understand how that's possible now. We would never be possible in our place with all the drainage and everything. But here, you can see that that, that would be the case and children were flung onto the walls and they, they tried to take sanctuary in the Dome of the Rock, but they were told you'll, get, you'll be given sanctuary, but no, they were all killed in there as well. It was a really, really bad time. Anyway, 1187, Salahuddin, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, comes in and takes the city. And then we move forward 1517 to 1917. How many years is that? 400 years? That is the glorious Ottoman period. And in between you had the Mamluks and the Seljuks and all the rest of it. And then unfortunately 1917, what happens 1917? The Balfour Declaration. Alhamdulillah.